takes away our sin, who takes away our sin. The Holy Lamb of God makes us alive again, makes us alive again. Amen. Let's all stand and worship this morning. I hope you guys are excited to be here at Missionary Grove today. Y'all, are, y'all excited? Amen. Amen. Let's open up in a word of prayer. God, we thank you for this opportunity to get together and worship you today, God. We praise you. We honor you. We pray for our worship team as they lead us in worship. And our prayer of worship would be pleasing to you this morning, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
You know, God is good. His, his mercy and his faithfulness is without measure. God, we just praise him this morning. All these people baptized. We just praise God for all the work he's doing here in this county at Missionary Grove. Um, Miss Linda's going to sing about the goodness of God. If, if God's been good to you, we want to say that the altars are open. You can come praise him at the altar. If God's tugging at your heartstrings to know him, to become his child, come to the altar. The altars are always open here. We love you. We thank you for coming this morning. Miss Linda's going to lead us, and y'all help us praise the Lord.
Oh, he is so, so good. He is so, so good to us. His mercy endures forever and ever. There's no beginning and no end to it. He forever loves you. He forever desires relationship with you. And because of that, God the Father sent the Son to this earth to die in our stead. He resurrected on the third day, and He sits by the side of the Father on His right hand. And the Scripture says that we are seated with Him in heavenly places. Amen. Woo, glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for all you've done for us. Thank you, Jesus, for all you've done for us. And thank you, Holy Spirit, that you don't leave us alone, comfortless, without you. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt
Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Was it worship great this morning? Amen. Y'all can be seated. Children through the second grade are dismissed to Children's Church. So if you got little ones, second grade and younger, they are dismissed to Children's Church. They can go there. We're going to get everything set back up and get ready for the preaching this morning. Temptation comes and someone stands to fight. Anytime somebody lives to serve and not be served, I know, I know, I know, I know. God is on the move. Test, test, test. You have to turn the mic on. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you guys for coming out to Missionary Grove. Um, we're glad to have you. And how about that baptism service? Woo! I, I hope we never take for granted what God's doing here. That is, this is such a special place and time. Um, the work God is doing here is a great work. We're all called to be part of it. And we just thank you for being here and being part of it. Let me introduce myself. My name is Crispin Pally, and if you've never been here before, I am not the pastor here. Um, when I'm done today, you'll walk out and go, it's a good thing he's not the pastor here. But in, uh, in the effort of doing what I told God I would do once upon a time was if you tell me to do something, you give me an opportunity, I'll say yes. I stand here before you today as a willing servant of Jesus Christ. So, oh, that don't clap for me. Lord knows, I'll mess that up. Clap for Jesus. So, let's, uh, let's talk for a second about today. We're going to be looking at Nehemiah chapter 6. The last, seems like six months, we've been in Nehemiah, but we're only six chapters in at this point. Um, and well, here's what we know about Nehemiah. Let's do a real brief recap of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is this Jewish man that has been living in exile. He's been the cupbearer under a Persian king named Artaxerxes. And he, to, to be the cupbearer means you've got a pretty good job in the, in the king's house. You're, you're the guy that's going to taste all the wine first. You could have a bad job if I guess they try to kill him, right? I hadn't thought about that yet. But you get to taste, you sit, you, you get to taste all the good food. You get to, you get to, you're the, you know, everything that, that, that the, the king eats or drinks, you take, you take it in first, and because of that, he's looking out for him, he's looking out for you, right? So we know that Nehemiah had received this calling on his life while in Persia, and it was to go back to his homeland of Jerusalem and rebuild this wall around the city. Now what we've seen is that there's been a lot of things happening in order to get to this point in chapter 6. Um, there, there's been a tax there's been lots of rumblings from within the, the people there in Jerusalem. Um, there's been some, some unfair dealings going on. And, and Nehemiah deals with all of this. Just he, He's a dude now. Like he's not playing around. Nehemiah just steps up, takes on the challenge, and, and handles it with the confidence that only you can do when you know you're walking in your calling. So let's get to where we are today. Um, I want to read a little bit of chapter 6, and kind of frame this up. So Samballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies found out I had finished rebuilding the wall and that no gaps remained, though we had not yet set up the doors and the gates. So Samballat and Geshem sent a message asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But I realized they were plotting to harm me. 
So I replied by sending this message to them. I am engaged in a great work, so I can't come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? Four times they sent the same message, and each time I gave the same reply. The fifth time, Samballot's servant came with an open letter in his hand, and this is what it said. There's a rumor around the surrounding nations, and Geshem tells me that it's true, that you and the Jews are planning to rebel, and that's why you are building this wall. According to his reports, you plan to be their king. He also reports that you have appointed prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim about you. Look, there is a king in Judah. You can be very sure that this report will get back to the king. So I suggest you come and talk it over with me. I replied, there's no truth in any part of your story. You're making up the whole thing. They were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. So I continued the work with even greater determination. Later, I went to visit Shemaiah, son of Deliah, and grandson of Mehetabel, who was confined to his home. He said, let us meet together inside of the temple of God and bolt the door shut. Your enemies are coming to kill you tonight. But I replied, should someone in my position run from danger? Should someone in my position enter the temple to save his life? No, I will not do it. I realized that God had not spoken I realized God had not spoken to him, but that he had uttered this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Samballot had hired him. They were hoping to intimidate me and make me sin. Then they would be able to accuse and discredit me. If you would, bow your heads with me. Father, we come before you today, Lord, with eager hearts and eager minds, God, that you would use your word, God, to bring us closer to you, God, to bring us into a greater understanding, God, of the calling you've put on each of us and how we should respond to that. God, we thank you for men like Nehemiah and men that you've put in our own lives here and now, God, that, that stand firmly against opposition, God, that they, they just have so much confidence, Lord, in the calling you've put on their life that nothing will deter them and nothing will stop the great work they're doing. So, God, we pray blessings over this time of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so... There's a couple themes in the book of Nehemiah that I think you have to kind of tackle first. One of them is that um, Nehemiah had a great calling, a great work to do. And much like each of us, we have a great calling and a great work to do once we've surrendered to Jesus as well. Much like Nehemiah, we've also each been uniquely picked for this task that God has for us. Um, I'm not called to do what Brother Frank's called to do. Jay's not called to do what I'm called to do. We all have this unique calling on our lives, and this is Nehemiah's calling. So at the the conclusion of chapter 6, I didn't read that, but I want to read one or two verses here real quick. I always do this to Frank and them and mess them up back there. All right, so at the conclusion of chapter 6. So on October 2nd, the wall was finished just 52 days after we had begun. I would call building a a wall around Jerusalem a great work. Just to give you a little bit of reference, think about the time, think about everything that, that, that Nehemiah and his helpers and his, his fellow countrymen had at their disposal. They had very primitive tools. They had very primitive materials. And this wall is two and a half miles long. It's 40 feet tall. There are 34 watchtowers and eight gates. They did this in 52 days. I would dare say that in 2021, it would be impossible to pin a contractor down and him say, I can do that in 52 days. <laughs> no offense if you're a contractor, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, so he had this great calling on his life to fulfill this incredible work. And let's talk about how he walked in it and how he, he got there to where they finished it in 52 days. The first step, that Nehemiah took when this calling was put on him was he stepped out in obedience and accepted his calling. Um, I I heard it said once that obedience is the measuring stick of relationship. Think about that. It's pretty deep. The more you truly love God, the more you will be obedient to him. The more you love your spouse, the more you will be obedient to the things you know they need. I can apply it to my work. I'm not going to say that my boss would love to hear me say that, wouldn't he? Um, but obedience is the measuring stick of relationship. And, and, and from this obedience, blessings flow. God made a way through all these incredibly, incredibly tough situations. First off, he's 
serving this, this pagan king who goes, yeah, sure, go home. I'll even give you all the, I'll give you this letter. So if anybody comes, you know, against you, that you just show them this letter. He gives him, you know, the rights to use materials from the land that, that he owns. He gives him this, this crew of willing people, and that is certainly a blessing as well. So his obedience to God predicated this blessing that it took for him to fulfill his calling. Um, the next thing to note is that another major theme is opposition. I don't know about any of you, but I feel very confident in saying the day that I decided to follow Jesus, I started to experience opposition in my life. Um, worth every minute of it, worth every trial, worth every bit of opposition, but it, it happens. And when Nehemiah set his mind and his heart to do the things God called him to do, man, it, didn't, it got tough. Had a lot of people get in his way. A lot of people try to trip him up. Um, and look, another thing to think about before, we, we don't know a lot. You know, this is the only book in the Bible where Nehemiah is referenced. Um, we don't know a lot about him before or after this account. But I know that at one point in time it says he stepped into this calling. So I'm going to assume there's a point in time where he wasn't walking in his calling. And he's living this plush, cushy life in the in the king's castle, eating good, everything's good. So I guess I say all that to reiterate the point. Kind of gets tough sometimes when you, when you decide to follow God. You know why? Because we have an enemy. We have an enemy that the Bible says prowls about like a roaring lion, looking to whom he may devour. And, and it was no different for Nehemiah. When Nehemiah took a stand for God, the enemy shows up. But let's, when, when you look at, Chapter 6, verse 2. So Samballot and Geshem sent a message asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono, but I realized they were plotting to harm me. It's really easy to read that and say, well, obviously Nehemiah's enemies are old Sesby, Toby, and Geshem. I like to nickname my Bible characters. Um, the thing is, if you're doing our daily Bible reading that we do here, and I hope you are because if you're not, you're missing out. It's really it's a great way to read through the Bible. A couple weeks ago, about three weeks ago, there was a verse. We were in the book of Ephesians, and Paul wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus. And there's, there's a couple verses in there I want to read. It's in chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, after battle, you will be standing firm. One of the things I think it's super easy to do, especially when you read this chapter and in everyday life, is to view people as your enemy. People are not your enemy. God didn't create people to be your enemy. I, I don't know how many of you, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I, I would say I've done this. I've allowed the devil to get a foothold in my mind before. I've allowed the devil in places in my life where he didn't belong before. And I can assure you that the devil has tricked me. You know, it says that he's got snares everywhere, and I've tripped in them before. And I've allowed him to use me in a way that would be hindering someone in their calling. Guarantee I have. So that's what we see here. It's hard, it's hard to like Sam Ballot, Tobiah, and Geshem. I will give them that. But the Bible tells us that they're not the enemy. Um, sometimes you see a tactic from your oppressor of direct confrontation or physical violence, right? You remember a few chapters back where it says they were working with one hand and holding a sword with the other. They weren't doing that because they were talking smack about them. They were doing that because they thought they were fixing to have to throw down, right? So that, that is one form of opposition that Nehemiah has encountered. But let's look at another tactic that the enemy uses to hinder us in our calling and it is called distraction. Now, the sheer irony of me preaching on distraction 
should not be missed by any of you that know me. I, I was talking to a friend of mine last night, and I said, man, I'm just studying my notes. He goes, dude, the fact that he let you preach on distraction is the funniest thing ever because I am the poster child for ADHD. I promise you, before this over with, we'll talk football. We'll talk, I mean, I've got notes to keep me kind of in between the guardrails because I know me. But let's um, not get distracted, and let's look at chapter 6, verse 2. We've read this once already. I'm going to read it to you again. So Sambala and Geshem sent a message asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. And then in verse 4, it says, Four times they sent the same message, and each time I gave the same reply. The fifth time, Sambalat's servant came with an open letter in his hand, and this is what it said. So this is a classic case where physical violence didn't work, so the enemy pivoted and tried a new tactic. We can't whip them, let's distract them. And if you, once again, are anything like me, man, this is the one that trips me up. Um, in Nehemiah's case, this distraction was accomplished through verbal threats. It was accomplished through rumors, through accusations. Um, it was basically an attempt to, dis- to, to stop him from erecting this wall that would deny the wrong people the ability to come inside. And I, I think about this a lot because in our own lives, there's often distractions that keep us from building a wall around our heart, our mind, our marriage, our family, our church, our community. God has called us to do that. Not everyone is supposed to have access to everything, right? So be very mindful of that. I heard a saying a while back, and I thought it was very fitting for, for this. Not everyone that's in your circle is in your corner. Man, that's deep. I know in my life, I've had a lot of people in my circle that proved they were not in my corner. Um, when I needed them, when I was trying to do a good work, they would distract me. Um, so let me give you, this is my little rundown of what happened. So the, the violent confrontation doesn't work. So SB, Toby, and Geshem reach out to Nehemiah and say, hey, man, let's hang out. Let's bury the hatchet. Let's just go hang out. How about meeting up at the Plain of Ono? It's kind of neutral ground. We'll, uh, we'll just let bygones be bygones, right? Let's just catch up. Well, the thing about the Plain of Ono, Plain of Ono, had he gone there, would have taken him from where he was supposed to be. They were asking him to go somewhere that he wasn't supposed to be. They were asking him to stop the work that God had called him to do. And the thing is, first glance, it kind of looks like restoration, right? It kind of looks for a second like, oh, man, we're good now. We'll make up. Let's kiss, hug, high five. But it's like, man, I know we tried to kill you a little while back, but we're cool now. Like, that, 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 that makes no sense in your mind, and it made no sense in Nehemiah's mind either. He had this red flag come up. He smelled a rat. And I would think the biblical term for that is discernment. Nehemiah had discernment about where to go and who to go with. And man, you cannot place too much value on discernment in your life. And the way to have discernment is to be close enough to God that you can hear him speak. You can hear the Holy Spirit speak to you in these times when there's turmoil and there's distraction. I know the lack of discernment will get you in a bind and discernment will bail you out. So, um, but, so they, they send this letter, hey man, let's hang out, let's be cool, let's be boys. Nehemiah goes, no nah, man, I'm busy. I've got a real big job I've got to do and I can't stop. Just that, just plain and simple, right? Um, he didn't do, I, I shouldn't tell this story again. I told this in the first service and I told myself I wasn't going to say this again, but this is what plays through in my mind because this is how my mind works. I'm from down the road that way. I'm from Paris. And I grew up, man, we were just a bunch of good old boys. Sounded like the theme song to the Duke's Hazard, kind of. Um, but if any of you guys grew up in a town like Paris or a small town, you had this, this group of friends and this group of friends. And every now and then, there'd be your crew versus my crew and dumb young kid stuff, right? So this is the picture that plays through my mind. This guy shoots me a text. I may have even been, had a pager back then. I'm telling how old I was. But, hey, man, I know we've had some trouble in the past, but let's hang out. Let's meet up Friday night, say, 9 o'clock behind McDonald's. You knew what's fixing to happen. That dude wasn't going to buy you a milkshake. 
So here's what you do. Nehemiah goes, no, I'm good. I'm busy. What would I do? Man, I'd have loaded up two truckloads of teenagers fueled on testosterone. We'd have rolled up in there, and one of us would have been praying that one of them just swatted at a gnat. And then it'd be like, dawn like Donkey Kong. Like, but Nehemiah's cooler than I am. Nehemiah's calm. Nehemiah's composed. And that's why they're writing about Nehemiah and not about me. But so he literally says in verse 3, I replied by sending this message to them. I am engaged in a great work, so I can't come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? And the truth is, I don't say this very often. Uh, I actually study my Bible in the NLT, which is what Brother Matt preaches out of. But this verse to me in the King James says it the way I like it. Maybe that's right, maybe that's wrong, but that's what y'all get to hear today too. So in the King James, it says, And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. As I was studying for today, that sentence just beat me in the head. I mean, I could not, it didn't matter what verse I got in, how far I would put it down and walk away. I am doing a great work. I cannot come down. That's all I kept hearing in my mind. All I kept hearing. And so we're going to come back to that, but just think about the profoundness of I am doing a great work and I can't come down. So they try the, hey man, let's meet up thing four times. And each time Nehemiah says, I'm busy. I can't stop what I'm doing. The fifth time, they push harder, right? Because he hasn't responded to their tactics. He hasn't given in. So the fifth time, they basically say, hey, look, there's a lot of people talking about what you're doing. They know what you're doing. Everybody knows what your plan is. The king's going to find out about it, and there's going to be consequences, so you better come meet us. The old infamous they. Y'all ever been into it with they? They said this. They heard you did that. You know who they is? They's the person you're talking to every time. Promise. So Nehemiah, once again, doesn't give in to the good old-fashioned peer pressure which obviously existed in the Old Testament as well as today. Peer pressure has been around forever, and I'm going to attribute it to the enemy as well. But once again, Nehemiah, standing strong and confident in his calling and relying on his discernment, I like what he says here. He, uh, man, I jump around my notes. I don't even know why I make them. Um, but basically, Nehemiah goes, none of what you're saying is true. Best of luck to you it um discernment i'm going to go back to discernment i got saved nine years ago i uh, prior to that day i was typical red-blooded young restless idiot ran around ran hard ran fast um surrendered my life to jesus in may of 12 and i start chasing after god hard and i start running with god's people the problem with that is, and I don't know if any of y'all can relate to this, about everybody I knew and hung out with wasn't like that. Right? Like it was, they're not, I'm not saying they're bad people. Man, I still love most of them today. Um, all of them. I said most. I probably should say all, right? I'm in church. Um, that's on live stream, isn't it? It's forever. Um, but I knew, I knew that I just couldn't go back there. I knew that despite the fact that we'd been boys forever, they weren't going where I was going. I wish they would, but they weren't. And so then, then you start to have these, these similar little deals in your own life. I can tell you what they look like in mine. Hey, man, this weekend, let's go, let's go to Arkansas duck hunting for the weekend. Man, I got church on Sunday. Oh, man, it don't hurt if you miss a day. Hey, man, let's... Uh, Let's go to the, the old bar we used to hang out. You ain't got to drink anything. Just come hang out. Everybody misses you, man. They'd like to see you. Man, I, it's not, not my thing. I don't need to go there, right? Or, man, you're always doing that church stuff. You too good to hang out with us now? Like, your discernment can even come across maybe as arrogance when you have to put some distance between you and some people. So, Nehemiah 
is keen on his discernment. He's not allowing himself to be distracted. And he, you know, basically says, there's no truth to anything you're saying. I'm not messing with you. And I think about so many times how much easier life would be for us if that were our response. Because I will go a full-blown defense attorney. What would you say? Can, you can't prove that. i got to defend myself because it's just who I am, right? Like I just, I'm wired to not really shy away from confrontation. Uh, Nehemiah, on the other hand, doesn't care about confrontation. He cares about walking in his calling. He cares about fulfilling the work that God has given him, this great work. There, there's a, another quote I heard somebody say one time. I think they actually said it to me. You'll never reach your destination if you stop and throw rocks at every dog that barks at you. Man, do I love to throw a rock. Oh, I can't stand it when a dog's barking at me. I want him to stop. But Nehemiah doesn't care if the dogs bark at him. He's like, I'm busy. Just bark all you want to, but you're dumb, right? So I'm going to say this. There's one more quote I love, too. Matt will never let, this will ensure this is my last Sunday to preach. I will attribute this quote to the famous theologian Mike Tyson. This is not in the Bible. Mike Tyson said, you, you know, w w l let me circle back here. Distraction. Um, a lot of this chirping and a lot of this dog barking takes place on social media. I promise you. Everybody in here that's on it, understand it. You can get down a rabbit hole at 2.30 in the morning when you can't sleep arguing with somebody over something you have no idea about. And they will tell you you're wrong, and you are not going to prove them wrong. My favorite Mike Tyson quote, not in the Bible, once again, that social media has made people way too comfortable saying things that should get them punched in the mouth. <laughs> All right, got that out of the way. I will never preach here again on Sunday. So... Um, <laughs> So let's, uh, let's get back on track. Verse 9. They were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. So I continued the work with even greater determination. So Nehemiah once again recognizes this attempt at distraction, and he uses it to fuel him on to work harder. Like he realizes now there are people coming against me. This is not going to be easy. Um, I have got to push harder, push through this. Now let's look at 10 through 13. Later I went to visit Shemaiah, son of Deliah and grandson of Mehetabel, who was confined to his home. He said, let us meet together inside the temple of God and bolt the door shut. Your enemies are coming to kill you tonight. But I replied, should someone in my position run from danger? Should someone in my position enter the temple to save his own life? No, I won't do it. I realized that God had not spoken to him, but he had uttered this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. They were hoping to intimidate me and make me sin. Then they would be able to accuse and discredit me. So, the scene here, we don't know much about Shemaiah either, other than who his father and grandfather are. Um, but I think it's safe to assume that Shemaiah is inside the walls of Jerusalem. So he's in... Nehemiah's camp he's part of Nehemiah's people group right and, and I think you also have to assume at this point that Shemaiah is known to be a prophet or Nehemiah had, wouldn't have gone to him for that purpose so this is the deal Shemaiah asks him to go and do something that the law prohibits he asks Nehemiah to go somewhere that he knows he's not supposed to go. And that is inside the temple. Now in the, in, in, in the law back then. It was very strict. The temple was, was reserved for the priest. And the priest only. You were not allowed to go in there. And so. Red flag number one right. This guy tells Nehemiah to go do something. That he knows God's will is not for him to do. He goes and tells him to do something. That he knows is against the law. Number two. He, he attempts to get him to lock himself in there to protect himself. Well, a man of God walking in his calling, leading this charge, that, what would that look like to everybody? At that point in time, you're a coward. At that point in time, you don't have enough faith in what God's called you to do and his ability to, to provide for you through that. You're just going to go take care of yourself and hide and cower down. Man, there's a lot of Christians that live like that in today's world. 
Have faith that God will provide everything you need when you're walking in your calling. So, if anybody tells you to do something that you know is sinful or against the will of God, discernment's easy, right? It's not of God. They are just trying to get you to do what they want you to do for whatever their motive is. So, I want to circle back to verse 3. I want to read it to you one more time. I should have it memorized by now, but I'm really counting on you, and he's not standing there by the computer. Verse 3. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. When you look at this story of Nehemiah from the beginning of chapter 6 up all the way till now, when he's faced with distraction, Nehemiah says, I'm doing a great work, I can't come down. When an attempt is made to discredit his reputation and cause him to sin, I'm doing a great work. I can't come down. When faced with rumors and threats that that beckon his presence away from where he's supposed to be, I'm doing a great work. I can't come down. See, Nehemiah has a wonderful view of his calling from God. And if God has called you to do it, it is a great work. There's nothing God's called you to that he doesn't place emphasis on and hold dearly to his heart. I guarantee you, however, that if you're doing that, if you're walking in your calling, if you're being true to the calling God's put on you, that you're going to suffer these same oppositions and distractions. I mean, in our own life, how would things look if you model yourself after Nehemiah? Um, One of the first examples that came to my mind, husbands and wives. We're called to live and love one another in this incredibly beautiful relationship that is a picture of the church. It's a a picture of our relationship with Jesus. I assure you, at some point in time in your marriage, after usually the man's messed up, you've, you've, you've let the enemy say this to you. You've heard it. They don't care about you. You deserve better. You're not really happy. You, you deserve to be happy. That's when, a, that's when a husband and wife has to say, I'm doing a great work. I can't come down. As parents, we've been trusted to raise God's children. We, we raise them as our own. He gave them to us. What was that? Oh, weird. Um, he, he trusts us to raise these children towards him to know him to love him and I don't know if any of you can relate to this I see it all the time in society and I'll tell you I've been guilty of it too you spend all your time you spend all your money trying to raise these kids to live right be right know right do right and at some point in time what about you thanks Will good man what about you? What about what you want? What about your dreams? Are you going to put your dreams on hold so you can raise these kids who don't appreciate anything you can do for them? Sorry, Reese, if you're in here. Um, what, what, uh, Sunday morning, you going to get up and go deer hunting or are you going to take your kids to church? Are you going to go hang out on Thursday night at Thirsty Thursdays with your buddies? Or are you going to sit down and talk about how your kid's day was and have dinner with them. Like, raise them right. Because here, here's what I promise you. The enemy will slip his toe on a foothold and go, man, you deserve to be happy. Golly, Bill, there's so much in life that they're, they're okay. You've got all the time in the world. But that's when, as a parent, I am doing a great work. I cannot come down. What about leaders, teachers, and servants in the church. And this isn't a sales ploy. If you're not walking in one of those roles, I encourage you to. The greatest thing about church is serving others. But what if, what if every week those who get here early and turn on the lights and give their time and their resources, their talents, um, run themselves ragged to make sure that their life is handled and church is, is handled equally as well. I guarantee you, because I've had this happen to me, the devil gets this little foothold and goes, 
Man, let somebody else do it. Well, why can't you sleep in and come to church with your family? You don't have to be there every time. There's enough people to do everything. That's when as servants and teachers and leaders, we say, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Lastly, I want to look at what I think really punctuates this point. I believe everything in the Bible, New Testament and Old, all point to Jesus. Je- Nehemiah is a wonderful example. Jesus is always the best example. So I want us to look at a few verses uh, in the book of Mark. I'm going to read these to you. It's Mark chapter 15. Then the soldiers nailed him to the cross. They divided his clothes and threw dice to decide who would get each piece. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. And a sign announced the charge against him. It read, the king of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left side. And the people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Ha, look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, save yourself and come down from that cross. Jesus could have come down from that cross. He could have harnessed the power of legions of angels to come and just destroy this entire scene. Under his own power, righteous, innocent, he could have stepped down because he didn't deserve to be on that cross anyway. But what did his actions proclaim? I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. He didn't allow anything up to the point of physical death to come between him and the calling his father had given him. He had a great work to complete. And because he didn't come down, we sit here today free. We sit here today justified. We sit here today forgiven and secure. I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. This time, I want to I drop the lights. I want everybody to bow your heads. We're going to have an invitation. There's two things I want to invite you to do. Number one, would anyone get up out of their seat and come to this altar and bow their knee to a holy God and say, God, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Ask him to strengthen your resolve and your calling. Ask him to give you a greater desire to be more like Jesus and more like Nehemiah knowing that you're going to see through the finish line because it's His will for your life. Pray for those who present opposition. Pray for those that are in your circle but not in your corner. But most importantly, pray that the desire of your heart is to walk in your calling and not come down. That's invitation one. Number two, if anybody's in this room today that doesn't sit here as I said justified free secure forgiven I want to invite you to come to this altar and ask Jesus to save you because he will he didn't bring you here today by accident he brought you here today to teach you a way that you can be with him for eternity because that is his design for you the first and greatest calling of anybody in this room is to be given into Jesus So if it's the desire of your heart, come to this altar and pray. I am doing a great work and I will not come down. Maybe you've got something in your life you need discernment about. Maybe you've got a situation you're facing that you don't know what's right, what's wrong. Maybe you're struggling with, are these people for me? And you need discernment for that. Maybe you just want greater clarity about the calling that God has on you. Because I promise you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have a calling.
I don't know if any of you can relate, but I remember back to the time in my life when I sat out in the pews and a couple church services with my knuckles white as could be, knowing God had something more for me. And it was my stupid, stubborn pride that kept me from walking in it. I didn't want people to know I wasn't saved, or I didn't want people to know that I didn't have it all together. And I'm telling you now, just like Nehemiah, if you take a step in obedience, God will provide the rest. Anybody just needs somebody to pray with them. Come on up here. We've got some men and women in this room that'd be be glad to pray with you, no matter what you're going through. stay here as long as we need to. This is a time when lives are changed. Pastor Matt says it all the time. Lives get altered when you come to the altar. So We're not going to rush anybody. Father, we, God, we just thank you so much for your word, God, for the ability to experience you in it, God, to learn more about your character, God, to learn more about your will for our lives, God, and to really use it as a, as a measuring stick, God, for where we are in our relationship with you, Father. And God, I thank you for men like Nehemiah. God, I thank you for men that you've put in in our paths, God, that have constant resolve to their calling, God, and will not allow themselves to be distracted, God, that they would be incredible role models for each of us, Father, as we live this life you've called us to and walk it as you've called us to walk, God. I pray blessings over everybody in this room, Lord, that you would just give them great discernment in their lives, God, that you would give them a great understanding and drawing to your calling for them, God that they understand the uniqueness and importance of their calling in the kingdom. Father, we thank you most of all for the resolve of Jesus that day in Golgotha hanging on that, that old wooden cross, God, that he loved each one of us too much, God, to come down. His work was too great. Your calling was too great. God, we, we just thank you for that. Words are not sufficient. God, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. God, and we ask you all these things in the name of Jesus. Hi, good morning, and welcome to Missionary Grove. We're so glad that you all chose to be here with us today. If this is your first time visiting, we hope that you've enjoyed it, and we would like to ask all first-time visitors to please go online to missionarygrove.com and fill out our MGBC connection card to tell us a little bit about yourselves. Also, first-time visitors, don't forget to stop by our Welcome Center where we have a very special gift waiting for you. Okay, gentlemen, please mark your calendars. August 19th at 6 p.m. right here at MGBC. 
we will be hosting our Men's Pursuit Outdoors Ministry Meeting. This is a great time for men to come together in faith and fellowship. We would like for you to extend invitations to your friends, families, and neighbors. For more information, feel free to contact Mr. Crispin Pally. Okay, ladies, beginning this month of August, we have changed our women's ministry dates to meeting on every Sunday evening at 5 p.m. right here at MGBC. We plan to have a kickoff event for this change on August 15th, again at 5 p.m. right here at the church. We will have light refreshments and child care both provided, so please be sure to come on out and join us for a great time of faith and fellowship with your sisters in Christ. MGBC continues to grow, and we are very excited about what God continues to do here in our church and through us in our community. With this growth comes the need for volunteers. We have several capacities in which you can serve. We are in need of a special needs ministry leader or van drivers for Wednesday night youth. We have several areas that we do need volunteers, and if you feel that the Lord is leading you to serve, then we would like to encourage you to please contact our Connections Coordinator, Mrs. Maddie Pierpoint. Thank you all again for being here with us at Missionary Grove today. We hope that you'll join us again next week. Please remember to share hope through the love of Jesus. God bless. Am I on? Oh, there it is. <laughs> hey, y'all. Um, between Crisp and preaching and me closing, we're really scraping the bottom of the barrel at Missionary Grove. So if you're interested in volunteering, <laughs> um, it's funny. Crisp and preached it on distraction. They gave me a list of notes so I'd know what to say when I got up here. Um, women's ministry night is August 15th at 5 o'clock and it will be on the third Sunday of each month at 5 o'clock from there on out um, and today from 2 to 4 at Ashley Arnold's house we are having a shower for Maddie Pierpoint here she is having twins it is open to everybody at the church um, if anybody has any more announcements we're going to pray and be dismissed Thank you so much, Lord, for letting us come here together and worship you today as a family. Be with us throughout the rest of our week. Be with our kids as they go into the schools and let them be a light and shine for you as well as us. Be with us until we can come together at your next appointed time. In God's name we pray. Amen.